All right, thank you, everybody. We're going to go and call this meeting to order the uh, school board regular meeting for Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. And before we get started, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Vice Chair Tice for the moment of silence. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to take a moment. Um, I'm sure most of the community has already heard that we lost a, uh, a very dear member of our community over spring break. And since this is our first public meeting, even though it has been uh, a couple weeks at this point, we just wanted to take a, a moment to reflect on the passing of Eduardo Molina. Right? Um, uh, so if you could just bow your head for a moment of silence, please. Before we move on, I did also want to just take a quick moment. I've shared this uh, privately with Dr. Noonan, but I wanted to make sure the community was aware of the board's gratitude for his leadership during such a rough time. Um, losing a staff member is never difficult and a part of our, I mean, it's never easy, sorry, is, um, it's never easy, but over spring break, we were really at bare bones staffing um, when we had experienced this tragic loss. And Dr. Noonan's leadership, his uh, his empathy, his strength in building relationships and already having existing relationships to build upon and gathering community um, was just really remarkable. And it was uh, something that the board is especially grateful for. And I know that um, he's in close contact with the family and I know has been a huge sense of support to them as well. Uh, and I think it was really just a moment to uh, that really highlighted uh, your ability, Dr. Newton, to focus on what our really our core values are and what is most important. And I think that really came through in your leadership um, during this hard time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Okay, now we'd like to move on to 1.02 roll call. Uh, Ms. Goodell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Gould? Here. Ms. Henderson? Here. Ms. Murphy? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Would we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to 1.04, adoption of agenda. Can I please have a motion? Ms. Henderson? I move that the board adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. A second? second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. All in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed? Abstentions? All right, motion passes. All right, now we'll move on to uh, spotlight uh, for Team FCCPS. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Noonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. and. Uh, board members, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and, and thank you for those kind words, uh, Ms. Tice. I, um, that was nice. Um, tonight, our spotlight is uh, on our, our desire to get the Purple Star designation here in the city of Falls Church. Um, and uh, we have a few folks that are with us tonight that are going to share a little bit about the, the Purple Star um, after our spotlight. But before we do, I just want to make just a couple of comments. And first is that you know, one of the values that we have in our community is, is that we have a very diverse population of people in so many different ways. And one of the um, hallmarks of our diversity is where people come from um, and are moving in from and moving out from. Um, and we do have a, a sense of uh, transition um, here in the city of Falls Church, which, which comes with military families, which comes with the State Department. Um, which comes with a lot of the, the government work that happens in this area. Um, but tonight is really um, a, a night that's meant to focus on those that are part of the military. Um, we are held to a standard um, by, uh, through the military compact, which is out there, um, that suggests that when people move into our community with um, military ties, that there are certain um, pathways that are cleared for them. Um, but this Purple Heart designation goes a bit further and really, um, in, in many ways, we hope will set us apart as a place that 
um, is, is even more welcoming to the community of folks that are part of the military. Um, on a very personal note, um, I just want to share with the board and a community that um, I, there's, a, there's a large military background in my family. My grandfather was a Navy chaplain uh, and captain on the Roosevelt during World War II. My gr other grandfather was in um, the European th theater during World War II uh, in the Army, um, and they did get along. And, um, my, and I was raised by Green Beret. Um, who served in, in Vietnam as well. So um, I'm very, very proud to um, support the work that's going on on behalf of this Purple Star designation um, by the folks that have put this together. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Brett to share the video, and then we'll invite Amanda Davis and a few other people up. Thanks. At Falls Church City Public Schools, we're not just preparing students for tomorrow. We're nurturing a community where every child including those from military families, finds a place to call home. This is our journey towards the Purple Star designation. At FCCPS, our mission goes beyond academic excellence. It's about creating a haven of understanding, support, and respect for those who've known the transient life of military service. With nearly 4.4% of our students coming from military families, their unique challenges and strengths inspire our pursuit of the Purple Star designation. This emblem of honor is not just a badge, it's a promise, a commitment to be a beacon of hope and support. To truly support our military-connected students, we're diving deep into understanding the fabric of military life, the discipline, the moves every two to four years, the deployments, and the resilience in the face of constant change. Our initiative isn't just about policies. It's about empathizing with the life of a military child, recognizing the sacrifices, and valuing the diversity they bring to our classrooms. The journey of a military-connected student is fraught with challenges, from adapting to new schools and peers to coping with the absence of deployed parents. At FCCPS, we're tailoring a comprehensive support system to address these hurdles through every stage of their educational journey. Upon arrival, we will provide incoming military families personalized welcome packets. New students will be paired with peers who will guide them through the transition and clear communication about school routines and expectations. During transition, we will maintain regular communications with military families, allowing students to stay connected with deployed parents and offering support groups for students dealing with deployment-related challenges. And when families depart, we will prepare students for their next move with a portfolio of their work and a memento from the school, ensuring a smooth transition to their new educational setting. Achieving the Purple Star designation is a milestone, not an endpoint. Our commitment will be ongoing with plans to deepen our programs, expand our support networks, and continuously adapt to the evolving needs of military families. This journey will transform us, knitting our school community closer together and teaching us the true meaning of service and support. A commitment to excellence, empathy, and inclusivity. It's a reminder of our duty to serve those who serve our country, ensuring that FCCPS is more than a place of learning. It's a community that cherishes and uplifts every member, especially our military-connected families. Together, we march forward, inspired and determined to make a difference in the lives of our students and their families. So at this time, I'd like to invite up Amanda Davis, and I think she has some, maybe some support and friends with her. I don't know if you all want to join or not, but you're more than welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, all right. Good evening, everyone. Um, before I begin some prepared notes, I would like to thank everyone who was on the Purple Star Committee. John Brett, Mary Beth Connolly, Sarah Cowder, Jessica Hollinger, and Jennifer McCormick. 
each one of these individuals stepped up when the idea was proposed for Falls Church City to begin the application and the steps needed to become a Purple Star designated school. So it is with their help that I'm here speaking with you tonight. So I really love and appreciate all of you for that. As John eloquently narrated um, in the video that this is not just a one-time commitment. It's not, it's, it, it's not just an impulse. It's a commitment going forward. It's not just a one-time thing. It's not just something that we're prepared to do only in the month of April, but we're prepared to do it going forward. Um, being a part of this committee, we all stepped up together and we are each other's point of contact in, our, um, in each one of our buildings and in central office. So part of Purple Star is that there's a list of things uh, laid out with the Virginia Department of Education and a couple of the steps were getting our staff trained. So each one of us had meetings in our buildings where we trained our staff as what it means to be, how do you welcome a military family, how do you welcome them into the building, who's going to be their first point of contact, who do we get them set up with when there's registration, when there's questions about transferring, when there's questions about credits for on the secondary level, questions about an IEP and other transitions. So each one of us are prepared to be a point of contact in the building, but also that welcoming face that parents will know our names. And then also with the help of John and our committee, we have a website prepared that has that information as well. We've also been establishing relationships with um, Fort Belvoir and Joint Base Meyer Henderson to begin working with their school liaison offices so that they know Falls Church City because they are very familiar with our neighboring districts. But in speaking with them in the past school year and working with them, they are learning more about Falls Church City and the wonderful things that we have to offer. Next Wednesday is a Purple Up Day. So we have a wonderful uh, things set up. So we're going to recognize all of our military students in our buildings, presenting them with a certificate and some other, as John mentioned, mementos and recognizing them in the building and their commitment and their dedication to the work, not only of their families, but coming in, being a new student in Falls Church City and being welcome. This is something that we're going to do go here and going forward. Another reason why we would like to be a Purple Star designated school district is that when each school applies for Purple Star designation and we've uh, achieved all of our commitments listed forward in the application, there are only two other school districts in the state of Virginia that are Purple Star designated and they are not in Northern Virginia. It's Chesapeake and it's Pocosin. So we would be the only Northern Virginia school district after our application is submitted and willingly accepted by the state of Virginia to be recognized as a Purple Star designated school district in Northern Virginia. Um, this designation will come in the fall, hopefully awarded by the Virginia Department of Education, and then it'll be another time for us to celebrate our families and then the commitment of our work going forward. So being here tonight is just the first step, but it's the first of many steps to recognize our families and their dedication and their commitment to being here and welcoming not only them to Falls Church City, but all of their wealth of knowledge of moving around the country and, and really enjoying the small city and everything that we have to offer. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, speak on behalf of all, all of the board in terms of the effort to, to achieve this on behalf of our military families that are here, that will be here, that have come. I think this is an important, and as the video mentioned, an important uh, aspect that we can do given all that they are doing, both the families, the parents that are serving, uh, the children that are making these transitions, and this is the least we can do. And hopefully we are not, yes, we might be the third school, um, but hopefully we're definitely not the last. I think this is the least that all of us can do as a community. Um, as a, a, my father went through uh, eight grammar schools and four high schools, you know, and the concept of traveling and, and hopefully that type of deployment and that type of transition is not the norm these days, mm -hmm. um, but I could not imagine how to navigate that as a student and as a family. So, um, so anything we can do, I really appreciate, like you said, Ms. Davis, this is not an April activity, this is a year-round activity. Um, so whatever support you need from the board, um, we, will, we will be glad to support that in terms of uh, recognition, resolution, attention, support, um, funding for this effort. This is the least we can do. And for all the families that are here, we really appreciate your service. I know that is said a lot, um, but I think it was interesting when we were saying the Pledge of Allegiance, it had a little bit different feeling tonight, um, given that you all are here and what you've done for 
for us to be able to say that. So we really appreciate that. So, yeah, thank you, Dr. Newman. Um, so we'd like to uh, take a, a photo and, and have just a recognition with, uh, with our families um, and, and, and show the community what we're trying to do and how we're trying to support. So will we can do that now? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so we'd invite anyone up who's um, part of the military family um, to get a picture with the school board. And then following that, um, there is a resolution tonight on the agenda um, that honors the month of the military child. And that'll be the first resolution read um, after the picture. So if you want to stay for that, hear that, and then you're free to go. <laughs> While they're going back, if I could, all the photos of people in that video piece are Falls Church City Public School parents and their kids, which is great. Thank you. And, and Dr. Lee, you mentioned that your grandfathers got along. I've got two neighbors behind me. One went to West Point, the other went to Annapolis, and they do not get along. So <laughs> I'm glad we have anecdotes of uh, camaraderie. So. Well, I'll um, add that I was, I was born at West Point Hospital. It's like literally in my blood. <laughs> Okay, so we'd like to go ahead and move on to the resolution for the month of the military child. Um, this is section 3.01. Uh, Ms. Murphy, would you please read? Sure. This is Falls Church City Public School Board Resolution 6-24, Month of the Military Child. Whereas Falls Church City Public Schools is honored to welcome and support the children of military families who bring unique perspectives and strengths to our educational community. And whereas the Virginia Department of Education, VDOE, recognizes April as the month of the military child, a time to honor and celebrate the resilience, bravery, and spirit of military children who stand strong amidst the challenges of military life. And whereas Virginia proudly hosts one of the nation's largest populations of military school-aged children and is dedicated to upholding the principles of the interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children, ensuring a smooth educational transitions for these students. And whereas the young heroes in our midst, the children of our service members, consistently contribute to our schools and communities, demonstrating unparalleled adaptability and strength, even in the face of frequent relocations and parental deployments. And whereas Falls Church City Public Schools is deeply committed to providing a nurturing, supportive, and high quality educational environment for all students, especially those from military families who bring a wealth of experiences and knowledge to our classrooms. And whereas through collaboration with military liaison officers, community leaders, educators, and local organizations, VDOE and Falls Church City Public Schools strive to offer specialized support tailored to the unique needs of military families during transitions, deployments, and reintegration phases. And whereas the month of the military child serves as a reminder of Falls Church City Public Schools' dedication to fostering an inclusive, 
understanding and enriching environment for military children, acknowledging the distinct challenges they face and the invaluable contributions they make. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby designates April 2024 as the month of the military child, celebrating their resilience, acknowledging their sacrifices, and committing to their continued educational success. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Do we have a second? Thank you, Ms. Henderson. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? I hope not. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. Resolution passes, and thank you for all the families for attending. Yes. <laughs> all right. And we will work, we'll now move to uh, resolution 3.02. Um, and this is the uh, resolution 07 24, the VSBA business honor roll. Um, and we are going to be honoring this uh, resolution in, um, in June. So tonight, uh, we're just going to pass the resolution. Um, and then we will uh, read the resolution, do a full uh, recognition for our um, businesses in, uh, in June. So for resolution 07 24, um, can I please get a motion for this resolution? Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Uh, do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Tice. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Great. The motion pa uh, resolution passes. <coughs> All right. And then we're moving on to 3.03, .03, resolution 08-24, Arab American History Month. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, will you please? Resolution 08-24, Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas the month of April is recognized as American Heritage Month, uh, Arab American Heritage Month, and whereas Falls Church City Public Schools are committed to recognizing and celebrating the diverse cultures represented in our community, staff, and students, and whereas the 2024 theme of the Arab American Heritage Month is celebrating Arab American heritage and resiliency, and whereas President Joe Biden first recognized Arab American Heritage Month in 2021, the National Arab American Foundation first recognized it in 2017, and whereas there are nearly 3.7 million Arab Americans in the United States, and whereas the majority of Arab Americans are native born, more than 85% of Arabs in the U.S. are citizens, and whereas the Arab American community traces its roots to every Arab country, the majority of Arab Americans have ancestral ties to Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Egypt and Iraq, and whereas celebrating Arab American Heritage Month is one way that we can honor the many contributions of Arab Americans to our schools, our community, and our nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board does hereby proclaim April 2024 as Arab American Heritage Month in the Falls Church City Public Schools and urges all to respect and honor our diverse community and celebrate and build a culture of inclusivity and equity. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. <clears throat> Can I have a motion for resolution 08-24? Ms. Sullivan? I move that the school board approve and adopt resolution 08-24, Arab American History Month, as presented. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Do I have a second? Ms. Murphy, thank you. All in favor say yes. Yes. Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. Motion, resolution passes. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to 3.04, Resolution 09-24, Neurodiversity Acceptance Month. Ms. Silverman? Whereas the month of April is recognized as Neurodiversity Acceptance Month, and whereas Falls Church City Public Schools are committed to recognizing and celebrating the diverse cultures represented in our community, staff, and students, and whereas April was, the first, recogni was first recognized as Autism Awareness Month in 1970, and whereas the month has become more inclusive of neurodiversity acceptance, and whereas it is thought that about 15 to 20 percent of the population is neurodiverse. This includes up to 10 percent of people who are diagnosed with dyslexia, 6 percent with dyspraxia, 5 percent with ADHD, and 1 to 2 percent with autism. And whereas the term neurodivergence describes people whose brain differences affect how their brains work, meaning that they have different strengths and challenges from people who have neurotypical brains. And whereas celebrating Neurodiversity Acceptance Month is one way that we can honor the many contributions of neurodiverse people to our schools, our community, and our nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the Falls Church City School Board does hereby, hereby proclaim April 2024 as Neurodiversity Acceptance Month in Falls Church City Public Schools and urges all to respect and honor our diverse community and celebrate and build a culture of inclusivity and equity. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Appreciate that. Do I have a motion for resolution 09-24? Ms. Henderson, thank you. I think you have to read the recommended action. Yeah. Uh, I move that the school board adopt resolution 09-24 as presented. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Henderson, do I have a second? Ms. Uh, Ms. Murphy, thank you. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you very much. All right. There's, thank you, Ms. Shaw. <laughs> All right, uh, resolution, uh, we're moving on to 3.05, resolution 10-24, School Library Month. And we'll turn to Ms. Tice. Yes, resolution 10-24, School Library Month. Whereas the school library is to ensure that students and staff are effective users of ideas and information, and whereas school libraries provide materials for teachers and students that will encourage growth and knowledge, and whereas the school librarian's role is to provide the leadership and expertise necessary to ensure that the school library is an integral part of the instructional program of the school, and whereas the school division has entrusted the school librarian in each school to teach the skills of locating and using information through traditional resources and new technologies to provide literature appreciation activities and to guide and encourage content and recreational reading to every student, and whereas lifelong learning begins and is systematically developed through the school library curriculum of the elementary and secondary schools, and whereas the school library contributes to the individual growth and development of all students while fostering both excellence and equity in education, and whereas school libraries serve as positive environments for all students to access and engage with a well-managed library that provides for free expression and access to ideas, and whereas the school librarians of Falls Church City Public Schools have dedicated themselves to work for quality school libraries for all students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board does hereby proclaim April 2024 as School Library Month in Falls Church City Public Schools and calls upon school administrators, teachers, students, and citizens of the City of Falls Church to recognize and support this action and to participate throughout the month of April in the celebration of School Library Month. Thank you, Vice Chair Tice. Um, can I please have a recommended action for... Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I move that the school board approve and adopt resolution... resolution 09-24, School Library Month as presented. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Ms. Murphy, thank you. Uh, all in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Going back to Neurodiversity Acceptance Month, although my neighbor, Rebecca Shaw, would be just as excited, um, Rebecca Sharp was also excited, so let me correct that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ms. Sharp. <laughs> all right. Uh, Ms. Tice? Can I just add one more acknowledgement in this before we move on completely? I just wanted to take a quick moment to um, acknowledge that uh, our Muslim community is celebrating um, the end of Ramadan uh, at sundown, I believe, this evening. Um, today is uh, the start of the holiday of Eid al-Fatir. Thank you, Vice Chair Tice. I appreciate that recognition. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to Section 4, Public Comments and Requests. I'll go ahead and read 4.01. Um, in accordance with school board policy BDDH, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. However, those needing a reasonable accommodation or need interpretation may have extended time. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record, be disposition of requests. Ms. Cadell, do we have any public speakers today? Uh, no, we do not have public speakers. Okay, thanks, Ms. Cadell. Do we have any written comments that were submitted to the board? Yes, we received 10 on parents as coaches and one on collective bargaining. One on collective bargaining. Okay, thanks, Ms. Cadell. Um, and Ms. Murphy, there was a change that was identified in this, uh, in this subject. Can you uh, highlight the change for the public? Please, thank you. Sure. So the change is that we um, added some phrasing to encourage uh, folks who uh, may need a reasonable accommodation or who need interpretation to um, come and speak and know that they shouldn't feel uh, constrained by the time limitation if their accommodation or need for interpretation uh, means that they take additional time. We thought that that reflected the values of Falls Church City. Um, and the way it came about was that it was mentioned by um, 
a member of the Special Education Advisory Committee. Uh, and uh, we took it under consideration and decided that it would be um, an appropriate change to make. Thank you, Ms. Murphy, for bringing the attention to the board and relaying that from the Special Education Advisory Committee. Um, does anybody have any questions or thoughts about that in terms of our change in practice? Great. All right. All right, we'll move on to Section 5, uh, closed meeting. Um, can I please have someone make a motion for a closed meeting? Ms. Murphy. I recommend that pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under Section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignation, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change in position, staff separation, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, leave of absence, and advisory committee appointments, and student matters under Section 2.2-3711A2, non-resident tuition student. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. All in favor, say yes. Yeah. Any opposed? Great. Dr. Newman, what are you thinking about the time for? Probably oh. five, five to 10 minutes. Five to 10 at, minutes. At okay. most. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and move to close, and we'll be back in five to 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody.
Okay, welcome back. All right, we are now at 5.03, reconvene to open meeting. Can I please have a motion to reconvene open meeting? Ms. Henderson. I move that the board reconvene to open meeting. Second. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. All in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed? All right. Uh, and now at 6.01, we need to certify the closed meeting. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Can, can I ask a question before we certify? Wait, you're certifying the closed meeting. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Go. Okay. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Fre Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business with only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Ms. Cadell, can you please do a roll call? Uh, can I have a second, please? Ms. Silverman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Mr. Gould? Yes. Ms. Henderson? Here. Ms. Murphy? Here. Ms. Silverman? Yes. And Ms. Tice? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Uh, Ms. Tice? Oh, I just, I, I had a comment before we passed the con consent agenda. As I was looking through the special education plan, I, want, I wanted to thank Ms. Rebecca Sharp for her uh, diligent work, as always. It takes a lot of detail, um, but it really, for the community that's watching or for those who are paying attention to special ed, I mean, when you see the dollars, the federal funding for the dollars for the IDEA versus what um, the, the federal mandate regulate, or man, the federal regulation mandates, it's the disparity is alarming. And as I was reading through the special education plan, that's just what was going through my mind. So I just I wanted to just note that if for any community members who are looking through that. Thank you, Vice Chair Tice. And thank you, Ms. Sharp. Appreciate it. All right, for the consent agenda seven, um, at 7.06, um, can I please have unanimous consent that the board approve the consent agenda as presented? Okay. All right, we are now moving on to section 8.01. Um, and we are at the business uh, for the meeting and we're gonna start with parents as coaches discussion. So I'll go ahead and just set up the, uh, the frame for this discussion tonight. Um, we've had a few We've had two school board meetings and a round of questions that the staff has, um, has uh, helped answer and address a significant number of uh, uh, feedback from uh, the, the community. And so what we're gonna do tonight is we're going to have a discussion around the parents as coaches. And what we're gonna do as a board is I'm gonna outline the, um, the options in front of us and we'll have a general discussion about um, our own thoughts of where we're at, what we've heard from the community, we can raise questions um, and, and we'll, uh, we'll move from there. Let me start with understanding where we're not. Um, it, and, and we've had a number of emails about this and a number of questions. Um, we are not in a position as a board to uh, write a policy that would outlaw or um, outright ban, I'm um, using phrases, um, for parents as coaches. Um, I think in all the discussion and the, and the, the discussions that we've had, we've clearly uh, explored the topic of limiting parents as coaches in certain situations based on the anecdotes that we've received. Um, but we are not, in the, uh, there's not support and there's not an interest to outright ban coaches. At the same time, what we have not done, or I have not done, I'll, I'll own this, is we've not expressed our appreciation for parents as coaches. It is true that we've heard a number of anecdotes that are concerning about how parents uh, as coaches have uh, uh, impacted negatively some of the students' experiences. But in our discussion and exploration of this topic, we've heard a number of examples um, of, of really positive relationships that have been developed by parents as coaches. Um, and I think to Mr. Laub's point at our last meeting, um, the professionalism of who they hire um, and the impact that they can have on a student experience is noteworthy. And I think as a board, we'll take this moment to say we do appreciate all the parents that have served as coaches, whether it's head coaches, 
assistant coaches, volunteers, um, and some of our, our coaches have significant athletic experience um, and, 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 uh, and lessons that they can provide for our students to make it a, a great experience for them. So what we have in front of us, and I'm going to outline the options, and if anyone on the board wants to identify another option, that be uh, we appreciate, but I'd like to outline the options, and then we can start to discuss those so we start to be more uh, organized about what direction uh, we would like to go as a board. Um, and if anyone would like to advocate for these options or talk about these options or ask questions, I would welcome it. Um, our first option that we have uh, explored is a amending an existing uh, policy. Uh, I'm sorry, the first option is writing a new policy um, uh, to, to uh, limit or restrict the parents as coaches. That's option one. Option two is amending our existing uh, nepotism policy to add language around the relationship as parents, as coaches. Um, again, not banning, but restricting and putting more uh, 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 accountability around that. The third option that we have explored uh, and, and has been raised is a regulation. And for the public, just to remind, a policy is written by the school board uh, with public comment over a number of meetings. A regulation is written by uh, the superintendent and his staff uh, without board approval, but it would be much more of an, uh, an operational approach to this, uh, to this matter. The fourth option, and it, it's, it's, it's two parts. One is um, to have no policy or no regulation um, and to, uh, and to assume that the attention on this matter uh, and the questions that the board has raised and the public has raised uh, would be enough for making sure that the athletic director, um, the superintendent, his staff are, uh, are going to monitor the situation, providing increased training and management around our parents as coaches. So that would be a fourth option. And then possibly a fourth option subset would be we, we approach this, we, we allow Dr. Newman and his team to explore the situation more now that it's been raised to our attention. Um, and we explore this again in six months to 12 months uh, when we have a better understanding of how this is, uh, how this is uh, unfolding. And if there's actions we want to take at that point, we can revisit this matter. So those are the options in front of us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, instead of me calling on each of you, because this is a board discussion, um, including our student representative, I'm going to let this be a free open discussion so we can all uh, uh, ask questions and, and, and have a discussion. So does anyone like to start uh, with their position or question? Mr. Anderson. Um, so I guess just so that the public knows, we've gotten lots of feedback, um, so lots of parents, you know, kind of advocating for having lots of restrictions on parents as coaches and lots of parents advocating that we trust the parents as coaches and uh, trust that the handbook uh, uh, that is there can take care of the issues. Um, and so we have lots of community feedback from, you know, all, all sides of the spectrum. Um, and so I think one of the main concerns of those who did not want to go ahead with any kind of policy um, was the concern that any policy would be too broad and uh, kind of be too large of a hammer for the type of thing that we're trying to address. Um, I think if you all recall from the last meeting, I think it was, you know, there were six or seven coaches who had kids on the team. And that's out of 83 sports coaches, 83 coaches. Um, and so it's, so it's already a small, small number. Um, and so at the same time, uh, there have been parents who have expressed uh, uh, concern over uh, things that they've seen their kids have to go through. Um, and it seems that you know, there should be some safeguards uh, around parents as coaches, particularly when it involves choosing their own child for the team. Um, and uh, it seems that, you know, while figuring out the appropriate language is, would be rather difficult, it does seem that some sort of process uh, that involves some so sort of independent oversight of those decisions um, or something along those lines might be warranted. Um, I do think that we would probably, like, if we gave the administration uh, some leeway, some time to kind of test things out, 
uh, we might be in a better position in the fall or winter uh, to actually come back and have a more robust discussion and potentially have a little bit more information to provide a more tailored, uh, tailored policy uh, slash regulation. I agree. I, I have appreciated all the thoughtful comments that we've received from the community on this topic. Um, as, as Mr. Anderson pointed out, they've um, touched on all different uh, aspects of the spectrum. And I thought, you know, we, we got some great ideas for ways to address this that uh, didn't come to mind when this topic first arose, and I appreciate that. I, I would appreciate a bit more time to give thought to this. Um, you know, I, I, my concern with a regulation is simply uh, that, and, and I'm not opposed to regulation, I think, I think that's actually a good approach, but my concern that I would like to address uh, if, we, if we go that route would be that this is an issue that when it arises, if it arises mid-season, the damage has been done. And, you know, these kids, some of them only play on these teams for one or two seasons. And so if they've, you know, been uh, affected by bias or, um, you know, something along those lines, then that's that they lost their chance to have a good positive season. And so my hope is that if we address this in a regulation, we have some measures on the front end that, uh, that ensure that that sort of thing doesn't happen. And whether that's um, incre enhanced uh, uh, scrutiny in hiring uh, or oversight, um, I, you know, I think that that's important, an important aspect that we need to address is, or, or to consider is that this is something that once it happens, it's, it's really hard to resolve. Um, I would probably be more in favor of a, of a regulation um, without, and, and I think that, you know, hearing from Mr. Park and from other school administrators at the last work session and hearing from the community, um, I think think that the regulation that I'm thinking of actually would be supported by, hopefully by, by cross sectors here. And if the athletic director, um, Mr. Park, you know, assuming everyone's putting forth the, the correct efforts into recruiting from outside of the parent pool, um, then this shouldn't be, this regulation wouldn't be a problem. But it, within this regulation, I can envision having just the steps that should be taken and the timeline that those steps should be taken. So, you know, if, um, you know, for example, job postings must be posted, um, you know, in these five types of places, you know, within the Falls Church News Press or, or wherever, you know, I'm not an expert in this area of recruiting um, athletic coaches, but posted in the, the places that make sense, the time, the amount of time that should be given for those postings to be happening. Um, it did seem evident from hearing from Mr. Park that the parent pool is not the first place they choose to go to either. And so if all of these steps are taken, um, you know, with the job postings and with the amount of time given for those postings to be up, and then we have to, and we still don't recruit the correct athletic coach, yes, we go to the parents. But so basically, not having the parent pool as being the first resort, but having the parent pool possibly being the last resort, but still being a possibility once all these other steps are taken. And I think that can be in a regulation. One of the things I was struck by, uh, by all the feedback that we got is that everybody shares a common goal. And the common goal is a robust athletics program that's beneficial to all of our kids, right? And that, that's pretty clear from, from the comments across the spectrum uh, that we've received from the public. And it's a goal I share as well. And I, um, have, I used to run a youth athletic organization. I know how difficult it is to recruit coaches. I know how challenging that time frame is uh, to have folks who want to commit. And I know we have some wonderful, uh, we have many wonderful coaches uh, on our coaching staff, including many who are parents. Um, I worry that a regulation with that degree of specificity would really limit 
our district from being able to maintain a robust athletic program, uh, particularly because we have many parent coaches who've coached for many years. I wouldn't want them to be the last resort to try to get somebody outside simply because the person happens to be a parent uh, of, in our district. And I share the concerns about uh, where the safeguards are and where the accountability is because, as Ms. Murphy said, uh, once the damage is done, the damage is done and it's not damage that's easily reparable. I know the stakes are really high in high school as well. You know, some kids are looking to uh, get college access or college scholarships based on playing time, so it's not the same as when you're with the youth rec league. Um, and the um, <clears throat> opportunities for us to offer a robust athletics program require us to really stretch more than other school districts because we are small and because of the constraints placed upon our teams by that and the distance that they have to travel. I was a high school athlete. I grew up in a similarly small school. Well, not similarly, but a small school that we had to travel for hours to play. So I understand what that is like. Um, and it's hard to get adults who are willing to do that, um, period, let alone uh, given what school-based uh, one sport athletic coaches get paid, right? So I'm, I understand the complexity of this situation. I would like, um, I think, uh, more time to kind of figure out what the right way to uh, manage the between the operational challenge here and the real realities of some of those operational challenges and whatever the appropriate methodology, and I don't have an opinion yet, is for creating those safeguards because we have heard from many members of the community that this is a real problem, this is not a phantom problem, that students have been really negatively impacted by some bad actors. Now there can be bad actors among any population of coaches, uh, but that students are impacted. It is uh, incumbent upon us to take that seriously. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Henderson. I, I totally agree. Um, I guess what I keep reflecting on that hasn't is that you can have a weak coach no matter what, and a coach can can um, demonstrate bias whether they're a parent or not. And so a lot of this, seem, and, I, and I believe that that is a minority of our coaches. I totally trust that our, for the most part, by and large, our coaches are fantastic and our parent coaches are fantastic. Um, but when there is um, a negative experience for a student athlete um, and a weak coach, it seems to me like it, it is almost irrelevant whether it's a parent or or from just an out, from outside the community. Um, to me, it seems like there's a gap in, and what to do when there is a weak coach, like whether it's communication on what the what the protocol is, or we need to maybe look at what the protocol, or changing the protocol. But to me, it seems like if it's, if a student athlete is having a negative experience and is experiencing bias or or you know damage is being done or, or whatever, I, and I believe that that there are there are some legitimate cases where that's happened. I'm not sure that that only happens with a parent coach. I think that just happens if you have a weak coach. A coach can can be biased for a lot of different reasons, not just because it's their own kid. So, um, to me, it seems more. Um, an opportunity to to look at our, our student athletes and our the families of our student athletes clear and empowered on how to uh, on what the proper steps are to addressing um, those issues. Thank you. And so when I started this about the options, we have three big paths. We could do policy regulation or 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 no action. Um, the regulation, as I mentioned, is more of an operational approach. Um, Dr. Newton, would you mind talking about, if we're thinking about the regulation, what what do we need to think about in terms of that regulation? You know, what would you, I mean, what would you advise around that? I mean, what are your thoughts around the regulation approach or any, or the approach that we've been discussing? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think what I have tried to do throughout this process is to try to guide you towards the, the means that, um, or the ends that you're trying to achieve. And I think it's been very clear in the communication that you've shared tonight that I, I, I do agree with uh, Ms. Henderson that we're all trying to achieve the same thing, and that is great experiences for all of our kids. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be asked <laughs> um, what my thoughts are. I, I, I just want to, by way of sort of sharing my thoughts, start one with just re reminding maybe the community more than the board, you know, I was a high school principal, I was a high school coach, and I coached my own kid. Nobody sat the bench more than my own kid. Um, because at the end of the day, like, the ultimate goal of, of the, the program was to really raise good kids, have good opportunities to engage with each other, build teamwork, and then ultimately win, right? So um, it's pretty high stakes, as was mentioned at the high school, uh, particularly high school level. So I, um, 
I appreciate, and, and let me also say how much I appreciate the parents as coaches that we've had. Um, there have been a number of times where we've had sort of, not to, to coin, uh, you know, uh, John Feinstein's phrase, but a, a season on the brink, right? We were at a point where there was a chance that the season may not go forward unless we had someone come in and actually um, take on that challenge. And in some of those cases, it has been um, parents that have really stepped up and stepped in. And we have a current situation where one of our coaches, and, and I won't get into all the details here, but um, is going to have to leave mid-season because he, uh, he's moving. Uh, he's moving, And so we're going to have to replace that person with someone, and the likelihood of, of it being a parent is pretty high. Um, so, so that being said, I just want to also thank the parents that have stepped up and stepped in and also recognize that there have been circumstances. I mean, there have been some circumstances where there is a perception, and perception is reality, right? And, and it's either real or perceived, or, or whichever one it is, that there has been this sense of favoritism towards um, uh, children of the coach. Um, I've heard that my entire career as a high school principal, as a, as a cluster assistant superintendent, as a superintendent in two different districts. It's a, it's a known known, right? We know that there's always going to be that out there in the land. Um, and, and as Ms. Tice said, that kind of happens in all sports, whether it's a parent or not. There's always playing time issues, but it is exacerbated when um, it, is a, it is a parent as a coach. So I understand that, um, and, I, and I also want to um, support this board in, in the work that you all are doing to try to put up sort of guardrails around that. Um, my, my advocacy actually um, is, is at this point not to do a policy. My advocacy is not to do a regulation, but my advocacy is to let me and the team do our work. Um, this has now been raised. Um, it was raised once before last year that I'm aware of that it, ha it has happened during my tenure. We dealt with it. We dealt with it swiftly and immediately, um, and, the, and uh, that was, was taken care of. Um, I don't know how much damage was done, sort of to your point, Ms. Murphy, I want to be um, upfront about that. But I do, I do think that we have mechanisms um, to also deal with the back end of this too. You know, one of the things that we are tasked with is the educational programming for kids, the social emotional wellness of kids and the like, and that extends into our athletics program. So um, one of the things that we can look at is if there is a circumstance like that, how do we deal with it? Um, going forward to make sure that that social emotional side of students is taken care of. But all of that to say is, you, you know, we now have an identified issue um, that needs to be dealt with. And it's, there's a level of scrutiny that has been raised because it's been brought to the board level. Um, and I would very much like to have the opportunity to um, work with our staff to try to find ways that we can do a couple of things um, to limit any um, concerns that parents might have. And I'm not suggesting that we limit parents as coaches because I, I do think there are circumstances where, you know, it's great to have our parents as coaches step in. So, so when I think about, okay, what can we do, I do think that there's a, there is a differentiated learning opportunity for parents who are coming in as coaches. I think there's a level of support that parents who are coaches need to have to understand the dynamics of an athletics program, the dynamics of our community, what some of the risks might be, um, what some of the values might be, but also at the same time um, providing them with ways and means to be able to deal with that effectively through outstanding communication with their families, hosting more, maybe more meetings than most coaches host, um, communicating more frequently than some of our coaches currently communicate, um, and even specifically calling out. Like, I know that I'm a parent of, of a student, of, of a player on the team, and I want to express to you um, what my values are as a coach. Um, but, I, but I think at the end of the day, because this has risen to this level, um, and there has been now so much outpouring of communication and support one way or the other, um, I, I do think that with the additional oversight of, uh, of the athletic director, um, really uh, putting it in the hands of that school principal, Peter Laub, um, a little bit more. We have a new chief of schools that will be coming in that will be responsible for the supervision 
um, and development of principles will also be involved in this. And then I will uh, have oversight of it as well. I think we have a real opportunity to uh, create a more robust um, chance uh, for our parents who are coaches to be successful uh, through an operational uh, process rather than through a policy or a regulation. Um, but if I, you know, if I were, so, so that, that's kind of where I am on this. Um, if the board were um, obviously interested in, in, you know, directing me to write a regulation, I probably would, would not be very prescriptive in that regulation. Um, the likelihood would be there would be some um, language in there about additional training, additional communication, um, additional support, um, where, where can you get oversight from. Um, but I, I don't know that I would uh, necessarily um, uh, limit, if you will, sort of who's going to be able to coach when and, and how. So, um, so I share that as that's a lot more probably than you asked for um, and, and probably um, more than you wanted. Um, uh, but I do think, you know, uh, you've got two people on the leadership team um, here in the city of Falls Church, myself and William Bates, um, who were both high school principals and, and Dr. Bates was the principal of the year in Fairfax County. Um, and we certainly can um, put our heads together and, and really work with the AD and Peter Lab to ensure that in those particular circumstances, you know, there's another layer of training, communication, and um, sort of relational currency that can be developed for those coaches with the families. Um, and, and then if that, if all else fails, um, let's come back and let's let's talk. Or if all else fails, let me say this: if if we do that and we still have issues, I'm more than happy to put a regulation in place, a super a promulgate a, a superintendent's regulation. Um, I don't know that that would substantively change the work that we would do, because if a coach is being um, is is be showing favoritism or is being negatively impacting a, a student because of. Uh, uh, the experience that they're having with that coach, we would treat them uh, as a coach that's problematic and we would go through the appropriate steps to first try to remediate and then if that didn't work, um, you know, if we needed to let them go, we would let them go. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Um, should, uh, uh, Mr. Ortiz was not able to make it tonight. Um, he did send a note uh, about his position on this. Um, and I'd be glad to share this, uh, but, but overall, it's, um, he, he mentioned that he doesn't think we need to take action to limit the opportunities for parents to be coaches. Um, he does admit that there has been egregious examples of bad behavior that we have heard from the community, um, but he feels that the, um, the position of the athletic boosters uh, is, is, the, is the, the approach that he would support, and he would acknowledge the issue and direct uh, Dr. Noonan and the team to gather more data before we make any action. So that's, uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here, but that's his position. Um, I would also say that I think, Dr. Noonan, in your, in your comments, I appreciated the acknowledgement that there should be additional training for parents as coaches, and I think you said it right, admitting and acknowledging that and, and that position. I don't know if we heard that from Mr. Park, or I did not hear that from Mr. Park, um, and I asked him that specifically, and he specifically said that the coach, the, the training should be the same, um, and I think it's important that, that we, as a district, acknowledge that it's different, and I was a varsity coach, and I, you know, I, I feel like you go one way or the other. If you had your kid on the team, you're either tougher or you're looser, uh, and, and, but either way, you know, that's, that's a difference as a coach. And I think that I appreciate you saying that we will, as a district, focus on that and increase our training or make sure we tailor our training to parent coaches. Um, so that's Mr. Ortiz's position. Other comments, questions we can keep? Mr. Lewin, you have some thoughts? I mean, as a peer of many student athletes and my own experience attending games, and I'm also the lacrosse manager and listening to my peers, the number of students who have like had issues with parents as coaches or have been on a team with a parent with a, with a coach that is a parent is pretty small. And I truly haven't heard many complaints from my peers myself, so I don't have much to say in that department. But I believe to, that that is a testament to the professionalism of our current parents who serve as coaches at the secondary campus 
However, with acknowledgement of the negative experiences of student athletes and the undeniable preference towards one's own children, I agree with the majority of the board that there should be some sort of safeguard over parent coaches to ensure fairness and give students a chance to excel based on their skills and abilities, not just because of their own family connections. Thank you, Mr. Lowen. I appreciate that uh, on the ground perspective as well as the collection of the, the student voice that you talked to and, and your firsthand experience as well working with athletic teams. I appreciate that. Questions or thoughts for each other on this? Mr. Anderson. Um, I guess we can kind of uh, see how it goes um, and then um, maybe put it on put it on the docket for the fall or winter just kind of see get a like a Noonan's notes uh, on like what's uh, what's been implemented um, and go from there so that's tease former chair downs is uh, language of getting a straw poll of uh, where everyone's at so mr. Anderson you're advocating for um, and I really want to say punting on this issue for the pun that I've just enjoyed, but um, uh, but uh, and, and letting Dr. Noonan report back to us about the different approaches that he's mentioned um, and seeing how they are uh, matriculated in terms of training. Is that your position? And then we revisit this in the fall? Yes, and I will also let the community know that Mr. Gould tried that pun uh, before the meeting, and so it is. Uh, it, it, it has been workshopped. It, it is scripted. Yes, thank you for pointing that out publicly. Uh, other uh, positions on where you where we're thinking, and again, we don't have to make a decision tonight. Just just trying to get a straw poll. If you want to think about it, we can also do calls. Ms. Tice. I would uh, personally appreciate hearing from more community members who have had children on teams where the coach has also had a child. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Okay. You know, I, um, I share David's perspective on um, getting really good feedback from the athletic boosters. I thought they had some really good suggestions there. So that combined with um, additional community feedback, I think we just hit it out of the park in my view. Um, and that's where I stand right now. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Gosh, the pressure's on for a good pun. Um, but uh, no, I think actually um, Dr. Noonan hit it out of the park with his <laughs> recommendation to give us a few months um, to, to, to let the dust settle with this new feedback and, and let them fine tune the processes they have in place. So do you have a where you're at or do you want to think about based on what you've heard tonight? Um, I, I still, I don't see the harm in, um, respectfully to Dr. Noonan, in, in, in having some sort of just guidelines. And if the athletic department is already doing all these tasks, there's no difference into what is already happening. Um, you know, but having, you know, a, a checklist basically of what needs to be done in order to recruit coaches. Um, I don't really see any harm in, in that. And again, it should already be done anyway. So um, they're, they're really in practicality, probably not much of a difference. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Silverman. And to be fair to Mr. Ortiz, uh, he hasn't heard the discussion tonight, so I know he'll watch the meeting and then um, we'll all connect with him about any updates in his position on this. And I think to Ms. Henderson's point, um, for the community, we'll continue to receive feedback, we'll continue to engage on this um, and uh, on this issue. Um, and then we'll look for a direction. We'll talk about a direction of uh, Vice Chair Tice and I will talk about a direction about with us with Dr. Noonan. So, okay. Please. Uh, just, I, I think if, if you do, um, before you circle the bases here, um, one of the things I, I would say is if, if you decide to um, let us put some of these uh, safeguards, in, or not safeguards, but additional layers of support in place that ultimately should become safeguards, 
Um, I would ask that perhaps there be a date certain um, that something go in, in Noonan's notes so it's not just the fall or winter um, that, that we say by X date, you know, we'll have collected some information and gotten some, some further feedback. That would be good for us just to have kind of a, a marker in the, the land for. Thanks. Okay, good point. Uh, and we'll make sure of that, so. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll uh, reconnect after this and just figure out next steps um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll work on, um, I'm not gonna try a pun, so we'll work on that. So I'll continue to keep that going. So that uh, concludes our discussion for 8.01. Uh, again, to Ms. Henderson's point, please, uh, for the public, uh, continue to give us feedback and to give us thoughts based on the discussion tonight. Um, we do want to decide this as a community um, and what's best for, as we've all said, what's best for our student athletes um, for their experience. So that's, that's foremost of our, our goal and our objective uh, for, for this discussion. So we appreciate everybody weighing in and we'll continue the conversation. Okay, we're gonna move on now to 8.02, approval of extended daycare sliding fee scale. Uh, Dr. Noon, do you have any intro on this? Uh, just uh, very quickly, um, before I turn it over to Ms. Michael, our Chief Operating Officer, um, you all had a really great conversation as part of the budget process um, regarding the extended daycare sliding scale fees and through um, some extraordinary work, I think on um, the daycare advisory part and Ms. Michael and others, um, we've been able to, or they've been able to create a circumstance where that sliding scale fee has changed, um, sort of out of the conversation that you all had at the budget table. Um, and then 8.03 um, is the approval of the, the new extended daycare um, fees that go with it. Um, they are not a one-to-one. -one. Um, so just so you know, we're not raising the fees as much as um, we're raising the cap. Um, so just, uh, just to say thanks to all of you for that really great feedback. Um, and I, I believe, uh, Dr. Anderson, you've been um, on that advisory committee and very helpful uh, in that conversation as well. So, Ms. Michael. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Noonan and the school board. Um, it's really my honor tonight to present the recommended changes to the sliding fee scale. Um, we were truly appreciative for the guidance that we got from the board as part of the budget development process and the questions about when was the last time that the sliding fee scale was adjusted. And then through that work, Katie Clinton, who's the executive dir or the director of our extended daycare program, um, worked with the daycare advisory board and, and thank you, um, Ms. Murphy, for being part of that daycare advisory board meeting. And they were able to discuss these fees both at their March meeting on March 11th and then last night. Um, the beauty of the sliding fee scale from my perspective is it really does raise the upper level income where families would receive support. So now instead of having a, a family income of 80,000 or more, a household income, now you can receive additional support in terms of reduced fees with a household income all the way up to $122,000. The changes to the scale were made without raising the fees for families that are paying the full fee. So we didn't pass the burden of this scale onto families families that were earning more. And then we also worked with the daycare advisory board to ensure that the families with the lowest incomes also were experiencing a similar fee level. Um, so what this scale really does is it extends those um, reduced fees up to a much higher income level and actually gives a greater level of fee support um, for household incomes in that 80,000 range and below. Um, so we really do think that this is a great um, change to the advisory um, from the advisory board we really appreciate the school board's feedback um, and implementation in approving these new fee scales. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Michael, and thank you for all the work on this. Uh, this is an important update for our families and for the opportunities for, uh, for this important program. Questions for Ms. Michael from the board? Ms. Sullivan? Thank you, Ms. Michael, for working on this and everyone involved in working on this. It was, I, I think, tremendously important as we had seen that these, that the, um, household income level had not been changed in, um, I think, close to two decades. Uh, quick question for you, though. I, um, I, on the, the first, uh, on this extended day care sliding fee scale, um, the, the, the first um, issue that we're addressing tonight, the, for example, the after school cost for 80000 and above currently is $337, and it'll stay at $337. But then when you go down, uh, the income levels, those prices actually increase. I'm just curious as to why the upper threshold stayed stagnant, but 
those earning less had increases. So let me make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. And if I don't, please, please make sure that I do. Um, this current school year with the existing fee scale, if your family income or household income was 80,000, you would pay $337,000 or $337 um, for your monthly fee for your after school child care. When we look at this recommended fee scale, now, if your household income is 122,000 or more, you would pay that $337,000. But if your household income was 80,000, for example, your fee that you would be paying each month would drop to $209. Well, yes, uh, I don't mean to cut you off. I, I didn't. I was not looking at this line. I, I was not lining these up correctly. So exactly what you're saying is true. And so I see that those making seventy to seventy nine thousand dollars currently is at three hundred and three dollars, but approximately next year will be at two hundred nine dollars. So their fee actually goes down and not up. That is correct. Okay, awesome. That's great to hear. Um, I wasn't using my brain and not I was not lining the um, lining up the, the household income lines correctly. And, and, and I entirely appreciate that comment because we had tried it both ways, lining it up. But because when we um, adjusted the fee level brackets, because they didn't line up perfectly, when we attempted to do that alignment so you could look across, it didn't line up right. So we, we stuck with this methodology that I agree is confusing and that you can't look across. So thank you for that question. Right, you know, and I was just looking at, well, the second category is $303 currently and goes up to 320, but that's actually not apples to apples comparison. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Other questions or comments? As a uh, parent who had children in the after school program, I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to increase access. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Anderson. Fully agree. Ms. Tice. I just time. wanted to thank Ms. Silverman for uh, initiating this. I mean, this is this is true equity work to keep an eye on this. So thank you, Ms. Silverman. And thank you to the staff for all their hard work and the daycare advisory board as well. Thank you, Vice Chair Tice. Okay. Well, this is uh, this will be a, a, a good action to move forward then. Um, Ms. Silverman, do you mind if I call on you to make the motion? Yes, I move that the Falls Church City School Board approve the extended daycare program revised sliding fee scale to be used beginning with the school year 2024 to 2025 program. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Do I have a second? Mr. Anderson, thank you. All in favor say yes. Yes. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. All right, now on to 8.03 approval of extended daycare fees. Dr. Noon or Ms. Michaels, should we go straight to that or is there a discussion? Ms. Michael? Thank you so much, Chair Gould. Um, when we look at the recommended daycare fees for school year 24-25, um, the Daycare Advisory Board has approved, and it was again discussed both in March and in April, a 3% increase in daycare fees. Um, daycare fees prior to this um, hadn't been adjusted um, for a number of years, so um, we would really appreciate this 3% increase in fees. Um, for daycare, the fees are set each year based on what the projected expenditures and revenue are um, with an attempt to balance the program. So when we look at fees for this next year, the CPI or the Consumer Price Index increased by 3.2%, um, but we're only asking for a 3% increase, which is also significantly less than the projected salary increases for employees next year. And when we look at when the last fee increase was, um, we increased the fees by 2.2% in the school year 2022-2023. Um, but before that, we hadn't increased the fees since school year 2019-2020. Thank you, Ms. Michael. And a question for you. This is, just to remind me, this is a self-sufficient program, correct? So there is no funding that we are providing from the budget. This is program is self-sufficient based on all the fees that is charged to families? That is correct. It's fully self-supporting and they even pay for their share of our insurance and some additional costs in terms of cleaning and other components, but fully self-supporting. So these fees will cover all of the expenses that are incurred. Okay. And is that uh, the, the uh, I think we saw the end of year budget, there was uh, to some degree a significant amount of funding left over, but um, you mentioned at one of the meetings that that money is reserved for supporting 
uh, playground equipment. This program actually helps pay for playground, playground equipment for other fees, for other, can you talk about what some of that extra funds are used for? Yes, absolutely. Um, the daycare program in the past has used additional revenue that they've had to make enhancements that benefit the program, but that also have a significant benefit to the school system. So as you mentioned, they had replaced the playground equipment both at Mount Daniel and Oak Street when they were most recently replaced, um, which is absolutely wonderful. When we looked at the revised fee schedule um, that we implemented, the new sliding fee scale, and when we developed the projected fee increase for next year, we did consider ending balance as part of that. So the goal each year is just to charge fees that cover the expenditures and not to create a balance. Um, but in those events where we do have a balance, we ensure that we spend that money to benefit the students that are in the daycare program and also the students in the school system. Great. So if there's any end of year balance, sometimes that's just the bills haven't come in, the expenses haven't come in. That, that money is already essentially allocated for different expenses for the program or related expenses, correct? Or we would use that excess um, funding that we have available to help with the next year. Next so it year. might help um, mitigate a future fee increase, for example. That makes sense. Yeah, and as a self-sufficient program, obviously, it would not be expected that you would try to get to zero every year um, for a self-sufficient program. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Questions for Ms. Michael about this? Okay. Actually, I do have a question. Is the, is, has, what consideration, if any, was given to making the cost of living increase essentially um, consistent going forward, or is this going to be a as determined? So it could be in every two or three or five years. So I thank you for that question. We had conversations. One of the things that we realize um, is that it's easier for families if we're doing more consistent smaller increases in fees versus doing larger increases and then having years without them, right? And the pandemic certainly was a wrinkle in this, um, but we really would like, you know, to try to continually each year to look at what is the revenue and the expenditures of the program and what small changes, you know, could we make in the fees to help it be predictable for families and not a significant burden. Okay. All right, see no other comments or questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and move forward with 8.03, approval of extended daycare fees. Can I please have a motion? Ms. Murphy. That the Falls Church City School Board approve the extended daycare program fees to be used beginning with the school year 2024 to 25 program. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Do I have a second? Mr. Anderson, thank you. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Great. The motion passes. All right. Thank you, Ms. Michael, again, for all the work with you and your staff on this. Really appreciate that. So, all right, now we're going to move on to uh, policies. So, we'll write to Ms. Minson. Uh, Ms. Benson? Good evening. We have one policy for waiver of first reading and second reading and adoption of policies this evening. That's policy DJF, purchasing procedures. This had previously been a policy of the board and the changes that are proposed at lines 19, 37, and 45 are important additions um, that would allow us to be um, consistent with the Virginia Code as updated by House Bill 1822. Um, because this is such a crucial change, um, to protect the safety of our students. It is language that we would recommend that the board um, waive first reading and go to second reading and adoption of policy. This language was incorporated into our policy GCDA, effective criminal conviction or found a complaint of child abuse or neglect back in August 2023, which was likely the most important of the policies, but adding language saying solicitation of such offense um, should also be something that's included in our award of contracts is important. Um, so would recommend that the board move forward on waiver of first reading of policy DJF and happy to answer any questions about this policy or the proposed edits at lines 1937 or 45. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Um, okay, so we are, uh, so in our, in our process of waiving, uh, waiving first and second reading, we have not formalized our process for that. What we are proposing is to have a unanimous consent to be able to waive first and second reading without a, um, a formalized process. I'm looking for unanimous consent to waive first and second reading before we ask for a motion. 
Does anybody have any concerns? Okay. All right, so now we'll go to uh, asking for um, a motion for 8.04 waiver f uh, uh, for this, uh, this policy. So can I make a comment about Please. this policy first? Um, just for clarification, because it's very confusing, uh, both the policy and the legal language, uh, the request here is simply to align our policy about contractors with our policy about staff as it relates to um, criminal behavior towards children, basically boil it down. Uh, and so this is language that uh, previous iteration of the board already approved in a policy related to staff, if I'm correct about that. That's right. And so we just want to catch up our, our policy for contractors to be the same. So just wanted to sort of uh, explain kind of what the thinking was and the intent was to have it uh, active as we go into this next cycle of um, contracting for next school year. And with that, I'm happy to make a motion. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Any uh, other questions or comments about this policy, which I uh, apologize for skipping over? Okay. All right. Ms. Henderson? All right. I move that the school board waive first reading and approve second reading and adoption of policy DJF purchasing procedures as presented. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Do I have a second? Ms. Murphy? Thank you. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Great. And in terms of the unanimous consent for waiving first and second reading, um, we will address this at a, a, a future meeting with uh, Ms. Silverman, Ms. Henderson, and Ms. Murphy's guidance on how we'll bring that up with Ms. Minson. So, thank you. Great. All right, 8.05, Ms. Minson. Thank you. We have one policy for second reading this evening. It's policy GIOB that was brought at the last meeting. There were no proposed changes from first reading on March 12th, but happy to answer any questions on policy JOB, administration of surveys and questionnaires, which would replace current policy 6.43. Okay. Seeing no questions for Ms. Minson, um, we'll go ahead and look for a motion. Ms. Murphy. I move that the school board approves second reading and adoption of policy JOB, administration of surveys and questionnaires as presented. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Henderson, thank you. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, motion passes. Uh, um, and finally, 8.06, Ms. Minson. Thank you. We have seven policies for approval of first reading um, this evening, and I should have said it with waiver of first reading, but I'm very grateful to Ms. Murphy and Ms. Henderson. Um, they've been taking time to really dive deep into these policies, so um, I, I think we've been making a lot of progress, and tonight you'll see that in um, this seven policies for first reading. The first is policy AE. This is a new policy, school division goals and objectives um, to ensure compliance with Virginia Code 22.1, 23.3. Um, and because this is an entirely new policy, uh, yes, because this is an entirely new policy, it's, it's to the board for first reading and happy to answer any questions regarding this policy. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Questions or comments from Ms. Minson? The next policy for this evening is policy AF. This is a policy that had previously been adopted by the board in July 2018, and we're coming with updates. Um, you'll note those updates are shown in strike-through font throughout, and red would be the additions or changes that are proposed by the VSBA. The other note about this policy um, is previously the cross-reference had only been to policy 5.8. We're adding a cross-reference to policy 1A.1. Um, that is the last policy in the numbered section of the policies under section one. Um, and that, that cross-reference is added based on the citation, the legal reference to 22.1253.13 uh, colon six is also made in our um, current policy 1A1. Um, you'll also note the language in red at lines 49 to 56 is um, proposed language that aligns with the um, Virginia Literacy Act. Happy to answer any questions um, regarding policy AF, comprehensive plan. It's like my math classes when everyone's looking down. So looks like we have no comments or questions from anyone on the board. Okay, great. Next is policy BHB, school board members in service activities. Um, this policy had previously been adopted by the school board in January of 2021, but there are a number of major substantive updates to this policy since that time. 
Um, it's worth noting that the VSBA updated version of the policy did remove lines 5 to 13 and lines 22 to 27 of the policy. That language outlines the priority of the board on planned trainings and the importance that such educational activities are budgeted for and the public's kept informed about the board's in-service educational activities. The VSBA in modifying their policies is removing language that's not required by the Virginia Code, but in reviewing this policy with um, Ms. Murphy and Ms. Henderson, um, it was the recommendation that those lines, even though the VSBA has taken them out, stay in because that is consistent with what our board um, does and what the hope is that the board will do with regard to in-service activities. Um, so that doesn't come up as a strike through, but it's worth pointing out at lines 22 to 27 um, and 5 to 13. Then there are additional changes at lines 29 uh, through 41, talking about the mandatory COYA and FOIA trainings, um, and then the school board clerk keeping record of those trainings. Happy to answer any questions about policy BHB school board member in service activities. All right. Next is policy DB oh, annual. Sorry. sorry, I did. Oh, sorry. great. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to be clear on, on the policy. I mean, this is all what it implies that we all do all of this. And um, I just want to make sure we're not overstating what we do on an annual basis. I mean, I know that I, I fully agree with all of the, the new things in red that, that are required. I know that we all do that. And, um, Ms. Goodell keeps us keeps us on track, um, which we appreciate. But the other uh, professional development activities, those are really option. Most of them are optional, right? So I don't know if anybody else reads this as it kind of implying that we always do all these things. That everyone does all these things. Did anybody else take that away, or am I being too picky here? So the in my reading of it is the intent is not changed of that paragraph from what it was before. Now that's a separate question from what you're asking, but the intent of the paragraph itself is not changed from what it was before. And that 15 through 20, it's just um, the language is a little bit different. If nobody else has any concerns, I was just, that's fine with me. I just was raising the question. Uh, the next policy is policy DB, annual budget. Uh, that was last adopted by the board in October 2020. There is one change at lines 22 to 23, rather than having 10 um, days advance notice in a newspaper of general circulation of a public hearing on the budget. Um, the Virginia Code changed to allow seven days. Um, in talking through this policy with Ms. Henderson and Ms. Murphy, uh, it's my understanding that we um, we want to make sure the public is informed that they're invited to meetings, that they know things are occurring. So even though the Virginia Code only requires um, seven days advance notice, certainly the hope would be that this information is made public, is available, and folks are welcome to come and participate in public hearing on annual budgets. But in order for the policy to be consistent with the language in the Virginia Code, this would be a change that would, would make sense, um, kind of with the, the expectation of staff that notice isn't um, by shortening the amount of time of public notice, that's not meant in any way to hinder the public's involvement in the um, annual budget process. Did I cover that well or anything you'd like to add, Ms. Henderson or Ms. Murphy? Um, I do think, you know, that given the importance of the budget process, um, I do think it's really important that we are all aware that if we are shortening the time, uh, I shouldn't say that, that if we are taking the Virginia Code's minimum time as our time, that that, ha that if in effect shortens our notice time, right? And so I don't, um, I don't know, Ms. Minson, if we are obligated to do the minimum time or we could say, you know, 50 days or whatever we wanted as long as it was more than, not that we want 50 days because that's not practical, but, you know, are we obligated to keep the minimum time frame or, uh, or not? I would say as a practical matter, we can advertise it any time we want. Um, our standard practice has been at least 10 days, and I don't anticipate that we would change that. Um, so we would likely stick with the uh, advance notice of at least 10 days. In the newspaper uh, medium is, it, it doesn't allow for any other, which is interesting. I mean, I imagine some communities might have a trouble if they don't have a newspaper that circulates, but we do. Correct. So, um, 
do we need to amend that at all to include other ways of letting the community know or is the newspaper fine? Newspapers are what is required by the Virginia Code, but we do post it on our website. We do send it out in um, in electronic notifications to families. It's in morning announcements. So on a lot of socials, Instagram, Twitter, yeah. Facebook, okay, as well. Great. Any other questions or concerns about this policy DB? Okay. Okay. Next is policy IC school year. Um, this policy was last updated by the board. Um, in October 2022, um, the changes are at lines 45 to 47, um, specifically stating that no more than 10 unscheduled remote learning days will be declared in the school year unless the superintendent of public instruction grants an extension. And I do want to point out that that is a superintendent of public instruction for the, um, the state, so not our school district superintendent. Um, so in addition to that one change at line um, 45 to 47, there's also an addition of a cross-reference at um, line 112 to future policy EBCD school closings. Any questions about policy IC school year? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Minson. Are these 10 days related to, because it's in the same paragraph as severe weather conditions. So are those because of severe weather conditions or, the, or can, uh, can we just have 10 remote learning days for any reason? My understanding is, is that it can't be for any reason. It has to be an emergency or for severe weather conditions. And I think where this um, becomes an issue for us is that we have announced that on the fourth day of uh, school being out because of snow, we'll start um, online instruction. So if there's a particular year where we have multiple big storms, um, we could get to that, um, that 10 days pretty quickly. Uh, and my hope is that um, not 10 days at one time, we might have one storm where we're out for six days, another, so that's two days. We might have another storm where we're out for seven days, um, et cetera. But I think um, I, I, what I understand is that we, we can't do remote learning days um, without special permission. We sought that several years ago um, and really struggled to um, work with the State Department of Education to allow for that. So two things. One, that has to be four consecutive days? After, yes, that's okay. correct. And two, um, even though this is under the paragraph of severe weather conditions, are we able to amend that last sentence just to say because of weather? So it's not just weather. It's severe weather or other emergency situations resulting in the closing of any school district. So okay, I, I just think that, so, okay. is there a way to tie that with that last sentence? Because otherwise that last sentence reads that it can be for any reason, is how I'm reading it. So I, I don't have any problem tying it. Yeah. I don't read it that way because it says unscheduled remote learning days, not pre-scheduled remote learning. This is specifically for when we have an unscheduled remote, we need to have a learning day and it's not scheduled, it's remote. Okay, so no, you're, yeah, you're right because it's unscheduled, okay. Um, yes, that makes sense then. That's, that's the safeguard I was looking for. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the board feels this way. I know I asked Ms. Minson this like three times. Um, as a lay person reading the superintendent of public instruction, I do not interpret that as the state superintendent. I think, oh, well, Dr. Noonan, well, I don't understand what's happening here. So I, um, I would like to see the word state or of Virginia or something so that when the community is reading this, they're very clear that this is not talking about Dr. Noonan having this authority. He does not have this authority. The state does not give him this authority. So I don't want any confusion that that's him. I think it'd be fine to add the Virginia superintendent of public instruction. Every other time in policies where we talk about superintendent, we just say superintendent. So it's the of public instruction that makes it clear, but I don't think it hurts to say the Virginia superintendent of public instruction. I'm seeing head nods. Does that work for the board? Okay, great. We can add that. So Ms. Minson, when we make this motion, assuming that the other policies will just have to say amended? Not because it's first reading. I think first in a second reading. reading adoption, you would want to say as amended, but for first reading, um, I would reflect the change then when we bring it back for second reading. Thank you. Thanks for okay. asking. Other questions about policy I see? This, uh, this is um, so nitty gritty, but in line 16 to 17, when mm -hmm. it says, and history and social science, is that how the state describes that um, academic discipline is history and social science? Correct. Okay. Great. All right, ready for the next policy? 
Policy IKA, Parental Assistance with Instruction, was last adopted in December 2019. Uh, the only change to this policy would be the cross-reference, the legal reference at line 14, and um, striking through lines 20 to 21 because the VSBA has removed policy IKB as a model policy. Um, so removing that as well. Any questions about policy IKA, Parental Assistance with Instruction? Smart. Yes. One of the things that um, we discussed when taking a look at this policy, uh, I raised a concern with, uh, I mean, conceptually it sounds great uh, that we would encourage parents to provide instructional assistance to the children in their home, but I think my concern is that, you know, in Falls Church, there are families with different needs and different abilities to support their children in that way. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that this policy sends the message that, um, you know, that some parents wouldn't be able to adhere to because of difficulties financially, difficulties with educational background, difficulties with language barriers. And so I just wanted a bit more time to consider if we could amend the language just a bit uh, to acknowledge that not every family has the same level of resources. So I share that concern. Um, in the Virginia State Code, we are required as a school board to um, develop policies and uh, got, develop guidelines to encourage parents to provide instructional assistance to children in their home, which is basically what this language says, right? Um, and I share that concern that we do not want to be perpetuating that that is the expectation that families in this district are somehow falling short if they are unable to do that for whatever reason. One, uh, one thing as you're, th as you're considering this policy, um, we could, if you didn't want to change the language of the policy as written, we could do a very short regulation that follows the policy that indicates that we would expect the training to be provided in multiple languages um, at varied um, places in the community to um, uh, open access in a variety of different ways. So that, that's something else we could do um, if, if so desired. I just want to say I don't honestly see the see how that's necessarily connected to this policy, like the concern over um, saying that some families won't be able to you know, measure up or do do enough. All I'm saying is that the Falls Church City School Board encourages parents to provide instructional assistance at home, and the school division may offer a voluntary training program. It doesn't say anything about parents' ability. Um, and I don't, I don't really see the, I, I honestly don't really see the concern that you'll have. Vice Chair Tice, is that <laughs> your finger on, the, okay. Oh, but sure, I mean, I guess I understand the concern from the point of when it says encourages, it does, if a parent is reading that, it does. You start to feel like it's something you should be doing if you're encouraged. So I'm wondering if the if the wording could just be finessed a little bit. Um, you know that we see value in it, or or if there's a way we can highlight the different ways you can provide instructional assistance, or the different ways you can find support for that assistance if you've felt so inclined or you felt pressure to do so. Um, I was also, in addition, I had a question on why it was just kindergarten through third grade. Is there a reason for that? Did I miss that? As Ms. Henderson said, this language does come directly from the Virginia Code. So encouraging uh, guidelines to encourage parental involvement and children grades K through, K through three is language directly out of 22.1253 dot 13 colon 7 C 5. So the code says K through 3. It does. Does it have uh, like other things for other grades or are we just I, not there yet? Or is I would imagine just... that it just has more to do with parents ability to actually teach the material to their kids or to like actually actually do that. Um, 
I know, I, like, I mean, I'm pretty good at math. I wouldn't want to have to do geometry with my kid in high school. Um, so I imagine that has something to do with it. Okay. So I might propose an amendment to the way this policy is written to read something like, the Falls Church City School Board recognizes that it can be beneficial uh, when parents are able to provide instructional assistance, something like that. And then the school division may offer a voluntary training program. Um, so again, just to take it out of the language of obligation, because um, it is beneficial when parents are able to provide, that's a factual statement, right? Um, that would make me far more comfortable with this policy and I think still adhere to the um, requirements of the Virginia Code. So to make sure I captured that, um, line five would begin, the Falls Church City School Board recognizes that it can be beneficial when parents are able to provide instructional assistance to their children in the home and then leaving the next sentence as is. Is that yes. amenable to the board? And, and I will say that by changing it in that way, it, it more aligns with the second sentence because it, it does, the second sentence of that policy uh, highlights the support that the school division would provide to parents who seek to um, provide instructional assistance to their children. So I think um, that proposed language by Ms. Henderson um, also uh, just is, it, it, it reads better. It, it seems to align more with the intent of the policy. Ms. Minson, can you read back to us what, how we're amending this? Sure, uh, line five, the first sentence would say, the Falls Church City School Board recognizes that it can be beneficial when parents are able to provide instructional assistance to their children in the home. And then it goes on to read the full, the full the paragraph that's Second here. sentence, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on policy IKA, parental assistance with instruction? Hearing nothing, we'll move on to the final policy of the evening, policy INDC, religion in the schools. This policy is a new policy before the board and would complete, would replace the current policy 6.18 by the same name. Um, this was the first time in working through the policies with Ms. Henderson and Ms. Murphy, I had to show them my bad handwriting where I underline, highlight, and make notes of where the policy when we're moving from numbered two letters changed. Um, this policy was last revised in 2011, so while there are some changes in um, verbiage and wording, much of the wording that is included in the model policy from the VSBA in policy INDC is um, word for word and line from line um, with the addition of a few ESs, a few additional periods, um, and deletion of a little bit of language consistent with our current policy. 6.8, happy to answer any questions regarding policy INDC, religion in the schools. I appreciated the uh, addition of the Oxford comma on line 17. I'm so glad. That's one of my favorite things about amending these policies. All right, hearing nothing on policy INDC, those are the policies for uh, first reading, thank you all for the time and energy both in advance of the meeting and at this time going through those. I saw there, I noted the two changes to the policies. So um, when I bring them back for second reading, I'll make sure those are in red font to point them out. And um, those are the policies for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Thanks for all the work on this and the leadership on this. We really appreciate it. All right, so now we can have a motion for 8.06, approval of first reading of policies. Mr. Anderson. I move that the school board approve first reading of policies AE, school division goals and objectives, AF, comprehensive plan, BHB, school board member in service activities, DB, annual budget, IC, school year, IKA, parental assistance with instruction, and INDC, religion in the schools as presented. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Ms. Murphy. Thank you. All in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed? Okay. Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to section nine, uh, future agenda topics. Dr. Noon, do you want to preview the next couple meetings? Is that? Uh, I, I think I do that at the work session. 
Okay, great. Yeah. Is there any this is just, future agenda topics that anybody wants to raise? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Silverman? Thank you, uh, Chairman. I uh, did want to bring up um, the concern that I had from the last board meeting that we had uh, about waiving first reading and, and moving straight to passing. Um, I wanted to see, um, and, and I shared this with the rest of the board, if there would be an interest in, if we were to do that, um, which I'm, I'm still not in favor of doing it that way, but I think a, a way to safeguard it a little bit is to require unanimous consent on, on those um, moving a first policy and moving straight to uh, adoption. Um, that way that even if there's one board member that has the slightest problem with one of the policies, it doesn't need, it, it, it can't pass on a six to one vote or a five to one vote or however many members are present, um, that you would need uh, unanimous consent amongst the present board members. Um, and additionally, I think that if a board member has a problem with one of those policies, that that issue would need to be a stated, publicly stated substantive problem um, versus a procedural problem with, um, with holding up that policy. Um, and if the rest of the board was amenable to something like this, then I would hope that we could add this to the future agenda items in order to um, have that extra safeguard. And the substantive, just to make sure the substantive um, uh, focus is to ensure that a board member does not uh, force a vote on first reading and second reading each time, correct? Exactly. It, it's basically to, um, it, that's exactly what it is. It, it's to make sure that there's a real, uh, there's a substantive issue of why they want to, uh, why they want to hold back on moving forward with that policy versus just, I don't like this process, so therefore I'm going to hold up the process. Okay. Thank you. Questions, thoughts, reactions to Ms. Silverman's proposal? Ms. Minson, or, oh. Would, would you like us to add that as a, a question? You have a work session coming up about policy, um, so it seems to make sense to sort of raise that there. Would that? Do we have a need for a discussion? I think is a. Oh, I would see. we want to have a discussion at the work session, or would we ready to be moved forward to implementing this as a practice? Uh, Ms. Minson, also, any thoughts on this from your perspective? Board policies really fall in the purview of the board, so if that's the approach the board wants to take, that that's fine. Okay. I'm very comfortable with moving forward with this as a practice pending our ultimate determination of how we want to handle policies. Okay. I'm seeing head nods, no concerns. Okay. All right, so we won't need to add it to the work session. Um, we'll just work toward moving forward to uh, implementing practice, the process for that. So are there future agenda topics uh, that we want to raise or any other concerns? Okay, all right, so that will be, that concludes our uh, section nine future agenda topics. And now we'll move on to superintendents of Falls Church City, superintendent uh, report. So. <laughs> Thank you, I, I'll take that, but not the state responsibility, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, first thing, um, sort of picking up on what um, uh, Vice Chair Tice uh, raised earlier is it is sundown. So those, uh, those observant Muslims, Eid Mubarak. Um, we hope that you have a great night of uh, celebration and um, breaking fast. Um, so first is uh, the science of hope. And I, I think everybody was at the, or many of you were at the convocation this year where we had a really great opportunity to hear from Rick Miller, um, who was with us in August. Um, he recently was back and ran a two-day training with our uh, folks, and it was a train the trainer event around the science of hope, um, and so that we now have certified local experts who will train the rest of our staff on creating and activating hope. It's a cultural framework for uh, that places students at the center of everything that we do, uh, and every decision we make uh, by adopting beliefs that all students are capable of success with zero exceptions. Um, we want to take a, just a second to thank um, Rick Miller for coming and for uh, Dr. Bates for setting that up. On April 24th, all of our uh, staff will be participating in an anti-hate training. Um, the Director of Education and Excellence, uh, Jen Santiago, trained a team of employees to lead these sessions, and they'll be happening in all five, five schools at the same time. Um, this is really a great opportunity, an important opportunity to educate our staff on how to address and prevent unacceptable speech and behavior. And I think you all have heard a little bit about that. Um, since we're under wellness, equity, and belonging, I do want to just mention, Eduardo, uh, perhaps one last time, 
Um, but as you all know, um, we've been mourning the loss of Eduardo Molina, our custodial supervisor. Um, he was an employee here for more than three decades. He was a beloved colleague, a friend to many in the division. Uh, and in this time of loss, I just want to say that the community of people in Falls Church City Public Schools really came together to support the family. Uh, and I want to thank so many of them for what they did on behalf of his family. During spring break, we held a reception and a luncheon for the custodians and uh, maintenance workers along with his family members. Um, it was, we were setting it up and I uh, was connected with his wife, Adriana, and she said, is it okay if we come? And I said, absolutely, the more the merrier. And she said, well, we have 16 people. And I said, no problem, bring them on. So uh, they, they came, um, we had a really nice time and it was a, a good opportunity for all of us to come together for the first time after his death. We shared hugs, tears, stories, um, we had two bilingual grief counselors on site uh, at the time um, who spent a lot of time talking with individuals and small groups um, and helping our staff and the family through uh, an extraordinary time. Um, we made sure that every employee who wanted to attend Eduardo's wake and funeral in Reston was able to do so. Um, our bus drivers took uh, bus loads of employees there both days, um, both to the, to the um, viewing and to the funeral. Um, and then the Falls Church Ed Foundation, gratefully to them, um, they helped support um, as a, con a connection and collection point, um, donations that could be made on behalf of Eduardo to his family um, to support the, um, the, the end of life uh, process that uh, families need to go through. And I'm proud to announce that our community raised over $20,000 in contributions within 14 days, um, which was an extraordinary help to the Molina family. We were able to pay off his funeral, uh, pay for food, and we still have some money left over that we um, hope to use uh, in some memorial in some fashion. Um, and sort of the, the leading um, idea right now are some uh, new benches at Oak Street, uh, and they would be the Eduardo Molina Friendship Benches, um, much like we have the Kathy Haleko Friendship Bench up at Mount Daniel. Um, all of this is uh, for, I think, many of us a good reminder that life is precious, so it's important that we love and care for each other um, all, all the time in our community and every day. Uh, in terms of IB-infused teaching and learning, um, uh, yesterday was a joy. I don't know, uh, you know, whether you like eclipses or not, whether you oversold it to your family or not, our neighbor was a little bit of a Debbie Downer. Um, but participating yesterday uh, uh, around the solar eclipse on the playground with hundreds of elementary students, students cheering uh, at the sun <laughs> and the moon um, in this once in a lifetime experience was the highlight of uh, my year. I will say um, you knew when the clouds were out because you could just feel the energy and the, I, I mean, kids were clapping and screaming at the sun and the moon. It was really phenomenal. Um, and all five of our schools and central office had an opportunity to uh, observe it through uh, the special glasses that were provided by elementary PTA. Um, and then our teachers uh, at the secondary got them as well from uh, PTA uh, so that they could safely witness this marvel. Um, so though the path was not in totality, we shared the experience that was unforgettable, blending education and wonder in a moment that will undoubtedly be remembered uh, as a highlight of many of our kids' childhood. Uh, in terms of resource management and continuous improvement, um, just a reminder, we are open for registration for next year. Um, last week we did open registrations portal for pre-K through uh, grades 11 students to register for the 24-25 school year. We're asking that all parents try to register their students as soon as possible. The community goal for us is 90% of our families by June 7th. Uh, and right now we have about 10%. Um, so we're hoping that that will pick up um, over time. Having registration done early really helps us plan for the coming year. Schools will know how many students to expect. Master schedules can be set up for enrollment purposes. Lunch accounts can be set up. Transportation can become more efficient. Tech teams can issue computers more effectively and efficiently. Um, so if you've got a returning student, please look for your registration email. Uh, from Power School that came to your personal account and get your kids registered. And then lastly, um, in communication and engagement, um, the School Climate Engage and Engagement Survey is out again. Um, this is the same survey that we issued two years ago um, to gather data and feedback uh, for our staff and for our students about learning environment, the school community and culture. Um, the, as I said, the first iteration of this was two years ago. And this was a follow-up so that we can now benchmark against what the data showed us from two years ago. Um, and 
as a reminder, um, this last year we did the parent survey and we will re-administer that next year. So we've kind of are on that alternating cycle, students and staff and then parents every two years so we can continue to benchmark. Um, and that um, concludes my superintendent's report for tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nuno. Appreciate it. Lots going on, obviously, in the spring. I know it's a, a busy time, but it's exciting. Um, we will start uh, with our own Mr. Loon. Uh, do you want to give our student, uh, student update? Sure. So on April 8th, the secondary campus held the solar eclipse viewing um, for science classes where students had the opportunity to watch the eclipse with their classmates. Um, and these science classes were able to go out on the field and watch it all together. Today on April 9th, the Meridian GSA hosted a day of silence informational panel. Um, tomorrow on April 10th, students will have the opportunity to pre-register or register to vote in the Meridian cafeteria. And this is a nonpartisan event that was sponsored by the League of Women Voters Falls Church. On April 12th and 13th, Forest Fest will take place in Isaac Crossman Park, where some student volunteers will help plant over 750 native tree saplings. Um, to celebrate the City of Falls Church's 75th anniversary. On April 25th and 26th, the Meridian National Honor Society will be holding a spring garage sale where they will be collecting books, toys, games, clothing of all sizes, small furniture items, and sporting equipment to donate to the Falls Church Homeless Shelter. On April 27th, the Give Day Club will be hosting their pickleball tournament, and all the proceeds will go to future Give Day meal packing events. Um, and throughout March, April, and May, students are encouraged to participate in the Friday bike buses where they can bike together in a large group with a predetermined route. And additionally, many students are beginning to review content in preparation for their exams at the end of the year, and things are starting to wrap up, which is very nice. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewin. And that was all the activity just for April, so you haven't even gotten to May. So a lot, a lot going on, so I appreciate that. All right, we'll uh, go to Mr. Anderson and move left to right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, last month, the advisory board of Recreation and Parks, uh, they met and discussed various things um, uh, related to the schools. Uh, they are uh, planning on resurfacing the stadium field, and they've been working with uh, Ms. Michael and uh, Brian Fowler on uh, possibly, um, if I'm correct, possibly coordinating uh, with the baseball field in order to get a more bulk discount. Fingers crossed. Um, and um, they discussed a few other things, uh, one of which was uh, that uh, the uh, tennis courts at Cavalier Trail uh, might be closed uh, to put in a, potentially put in a flow equalization tank uh, underneath the tennis courts um, in order to uh, help uh, with the uh, water flow um, and things. Um, so, uh, but I, I assume more, uh, more will be said about that in the future. Um, the uh, Gifted Education Advisory Committee also met last month. Um, and so there was lots of things going on at uh, Oak Street, which I think uh, was mentioned at one of the last meetings, but uh, there were uh, approximately 21 teams uh, in the Odyssey of the Mind competition uh, with which included approximately 140 students, um, and four teams are going to the state competition, uh, so that's very exciting for them. Um, and uh, they also mentioned that the state gifted office name uh, changed its name to the Office of Advanced Learning, and so the committee uh, was considering uh, 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 presenting a potential name change uh, to more align with that, so something along the lines of Advanced Academics Advisor Committee. Um, but that's for future discussion as well, I assume. Um, and then there was a discussion about uh, how to ensure good study habits uh, among the uh, um, gifted students, uh, and then also a discussion around improving uh, uh, the website uh, and the information around uh, gifted education with a focus on the FAQ section. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Ms. Anderson. The BIE group met a few weeks ago. Um, BIE members have been involved in all of the major school events that have happened. Uh, STEAM night in the last couple months, PYP exhibition, sports medicine open house, international night, robotics competition. Uh, so it's great to see our businesses and our schools working together. They also selected their nominees for the VSBA honor roll uh, and other awards that the BIE nominates or um, provides. And those folks will be recognized on June 11th before this meeting. 
uh, at a special reception. And then the um, group uh, continued talking about uh, various proposals for how to better manage and streamline fundraising from the of the business community or from the business community by athletics and student clubs uh, to try to get out of this everybody kind of operating at cross purposes with each other. So that's a continued conversation. Um, the PTAs are continuing to do great work. I'd encourage any community member who is not already a member of the PTAs to sign up and become a member of the PTAs uh, because there's lots of wonderful information that comes from the PTAs in their newsletters as well as they continue to hold uh, open meetings that have different substantive content such as a meeting on the secondary campus last month about speaking with kids about alcohol and drugs. Um, the MEH PTA also had its, I think, second annual uh, wine night fundraiser, uh, which sold 100 tickets and raised a lot of money to help support eighth grade moving up night. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I attended the Health and Wellness Advisory Committee. Um, got a very warm welcome. I, I really enjoyed um, being with, with the group uh, last Thursday evening. We had one public comment for the Health and, and Wellness Committee. Um, one uh, parent wrote in about using food as a reward um, and um, was really trying to encourage that the, uh, Falls Church City Schools don't use food as a reward, motivation, or a way to entertain children. Um, MEH is having their field day on May 31st, and they are still looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in that, um, please get in touch. Um, there's, as Mr. Lewin had mentioned, there's the bike bus um, for the secondary campus, which seems like a great activity way to get exercise and get to school in a um, environmentally clean way by riding your bus to school in a large group. And they were looking to uh, extend that to um, possibly Oak Street as well at some point. On April 16th, next Tuesday evening, um, unfortunately, I'm going to miss it. I think it sounds like a really, really uh, great opportunity. There's going to be a mindfulness seminar at Meridian. This is for parents, not for students. Um, but in the Meridian Library on April 16th, a mindfulness um, uh, course that will be taught. And um, the final thing is um, there was discussion about the recess time at Oak Street. And I, I think, Dr. Noonan, I think that has now shifted so that the Oak Street students are now getting these exact same amount of minutes outside or, or inside of its indoor recess um, as they had been getting. That's correct. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Uh, the two primary meetings I attend is the Falls Church Education Foundation uh, uh, remotely. Um, and there's a lot of great activity, including the gala that's coming up. Uh, that is a, a, a large fundraiser uh, for, for the foundation. Um, and also at that meeting, they did uh, say their goodbyes to Sean Lewin and Abby Lilly, who are the student representatives of the foundation, who have, uh, I, it was Dr. Noonan, they were talking uh, longer about Sean and Abby than, uh, than I think Sean and Abby really wanted to hear. Uh, but, but they were clearly, there's a lot of praise sent your way about all the dedication commitment. Um, if you've ever gone to a foundation meeting or event, Sean and or Abby have been there. Um, I think they've attended more foundation meetings than most foundation members. And, and I think this is just the beginning of the uh, Sean Lewin goodbye tour. <laughs> yes, yes. So we are not going to say goodbye. We're actually going to have him remotely log in next year when you're a fountain. So <laughs> we won't be doing that. But, uh, but no, it was a great, great, uh, great, uh, all the work that you've done, Sean and Abby, we really, uh, is very impressive. And then also uh, we attended the uh, budget and finance meeting. Uh, Ms. Michael and Dr. Noonan and I uh, presented to the city council um, and uh, felt like it went well. I guess we'll find out. Uh, but, but we answered the questions. I uh, appreciate the support, um, Vice Chair Tice and Mr. Anderson in person um, for, for, uh, for supporting uh, our presentation. So that was our, that was mine. Okay, the only update I have is that in addition to it being um, National School Library Week, it's also National Library Week, and today is National Library Workers Day. And so the Mary Riley Stiles Public Library Foundation has been celebrating the librarians and staff at Mary Riley Stiles with um, treats and lunch, and Lazy Mike's is such a great partner as always. Um, and gifts throughout the week. So if you happen to stop be at the public library this week, make sure to say an extra special thank you to our awesome librarians at our public library, in addition to all that's being acknowledged in our uh, school libraries. So I uh, don't have anything to report from the Special Education Advisory Committee, but um, 
And my report from the daycare advisory uh, board is brief because the big excitement last night was um, unanimous approval by the committee of the uh, fees for next year and also the new sliding scale uh, fee schedule. Yes, so um, that was the big excitement, which you all heard about already tonight. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. All right, so that concludes our board and student liaison comments for section 11. Thank you all for the attention and commitment to your uh, committees and groups that, um, that are important for the board to understand our connection to the community. We will now move on to section 12, approval of minutes. One uh, second, Mr. Gould. Oh, uh, yes, can, I, can, I, can I add one more thing? Um, I got to take my boys uh, to, uh, my wife and I took the boys to the robotics competition over spring break. So I just want to give a shout out to them. It was it was quite a it was quite a scene. Um, and so for anybody who went, uh, it was awesome. If you ever get a chance to go, it's very entertaining, uh, and uh, the students did a great job. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, we always appreciate when they come in and present, and sometimes bring in the robot itself. So that's uh, yeah, it's it's an impressive act. Uh, I would say activity, but I think it's considered a varsity uh, a varsity sport in terms of how much time they spend. So appreciate you going and yeah. All right, uh, so for section 12, approval of minutes, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna ask for unanimous consent to approve the minutes of February 28, 2023, February 27, 2024, and March 12, 2024 as presented. Unanimous consent, all right, thank you very much, and thanks, Ms. Goodell, for the work on this, as always. Um, and now, uh, section 13, materials for board review, we have 13.01, the FCCPS enrollment, and the 13.02, monthly budget monitoring report. Any questions or comments on these two documents? Okay. All right. Uh, that concludes our primary meeting, uh, our, our open meeting. We're going to be moving to close for the rest of the evening. Um, so, uh, staff and students, you get uh, you get to, to end the night at this point, and for the public, um, you can. We will not be uh, reconvening for uh, for open. So this will be conclude the open meeting. Um, so to do that, I'm going to ask for a motion to move us to closed 14.01, Mr. Anderson. Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose: to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, legal matters under Section 2.2-3711A8. In particular, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. And legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7, in particular, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such con consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation, negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Do I have a second? Ms. Murphy, thank you. All in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed? All right, we'll move to closed. Thank you everybody for attending.